Everyone? You know, uh, it's only been two weeks, but man, whenever I, I uh, sit and listen to the music in front of me and I listen to you all behind me, man, it's so moving. And I'm so blessed. I think I could go home right now. But uh, we have a little bit more to do, a few more minutes. I want to welcome everyone here to the Hinsdale Phil M S D A Church. Last week, you all welcomed us very warmly. Now it's my turn. So welcome everyone to uh, Hinsdale Phil M. We're glad that you're here. Amen? Amen? I hope that you're glad that you're here as well. I believe whenever God's people come together, it's something special. And by the way, Elder Mike, no pressure. If you guys have lunch plans, that's okay. But if you don't, you ought to stay for potluck. It's really, these people know how to cook. It's, it's, it's really good. So uh, if you guys don't, no pressure, no pressure. Um, last week was so fun. I had a really, really good time last week, and I hope you did too. Uh, last week, especially during AY, when uh, the young people were giving us some question and answer time, I was really having fun with that, and I just really appreciated everyone uh, uh, and their and your questions and all. But there was two questions, actually, that came up afterwards that I thought I should, I should probably just hit real quick before we get into uh, the Word today. I hope that's okay with you. By the way, pray for us, because any minute now, my wife is going to give birth. <laughs> so if this is like the shortest sermon ever, and you see us like uh, going back over there and leaving, it's, that's why, okay? But um, it's any time now, according to the doctor and according to her, what she knows is her body. This is, it, this is her fourth time, so she knows well. So uh, we, we uh, <laughs> this could be any minute. <laughs> but last week, um, one question that came to me afterwards, and I thought it was a really sincere question. I thought it was a really good question. The question was, so Glenn, what does a pastor do? <laughs> That's a really good question, you know? You know, some people think that the pastor just preaches on Sabbath. That's it. But I'll tell you what a pastor does. Uh, in short, maybe um, in, in, a, in a way that will help you uh, remember it. So a, a, a pastor's job is to feed, lead, and intercede. That's what I do, okay? If you wonder what, what we do as a pastor's job, we feed, we mean, meaning we, we feed people. Our, our, uh, our duty is to, is to make sure that they're fed from the Word of God every week or other times in between. And that's our job. We take this job very, very seriously. It's also to lead. Uh, so we get our cues from God, and our time with the Lord is what direction the church needs to go to. And, and so part of our job is to lead, but also it's to intercede. And I know that you all... Um, understand what that is, and that my, my job, my holy position is to, is to intercede for our church between God and anything that we have to pray about, that that's my responsibility too. So it's to feed and to lead and to intercede. You guys can remember that? So it's something that a pastor does, um, is that. And then the second question came, I thought that was so good. And a young person said to me, so um, you, you mentioned that you had a few calls, so why Hinsdale Phil M? If you had a few things to choose from, why did you choose Hinsdale Phil Am? Well, the answer is really, really simple. The winters. <laughs> All right, let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. No, well, really, it's because, it's because every time we prayed, that door kept getting wider and wider. Every time we prayed, that door kept getting wider and wider. And finally, when that door opened up to us fully, we said, Yes, sir. No turning back. And so that's why we're here. It's as simple as that. So we're looking forward to what God has in store for us here at Hinsdale for them because we believe God opened the door and we're answering his call. Heavenly Father, one more time, we just ask you that these next few minutes that you would bless, that you would teach, that you would inspire. Like Uncle Mott said, Lord, we need your voice to speak to us, not mine, not anyone else's. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would shut out any other noise so that we can hear the voice of God today speaking to us. And I thank you, Lord, for helping us and answering that prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So metaphors are really important. Let me just grab some water here real quick. Metaphors are really important. The Bible uses metaphors to describe the church. And Jesus used metaphors many times. As he was teaching... He taught the people that the kingdom of God is like, and then he would say, mustard seed. 
Or the kingdom of God is like a field. Or the kingdom of God is like leaven. There were so many, or like a pearl. You remember some of these stories that Jesus taught? So the kingdom of God was like, and he would use a metaphor. And metaphors are so important. I think they just deepen our understanding of scripture and what Jesus is really trying to say. And this week and next week, I have two more shots at, 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 at teaching us, reminding us um, what Jesus had in mind for the church and why I still believe in church. And I hope that this week and next, and next week, I could, I could give you a, a greater sense and a greater vision of what church is and how powerful the church could be. And why I still believe in the local church, I think this is where it's at, right here, what we're doing right now. It's, it's, it's what God ordained. And so there's a metaphor that, uh, that I've been using. There's a metaphor that many, I think, have been using. And it's probably the most popular metaphor out there when we describe the church. And it's this. You might have heard it. It's this right here. The church is a hospital for sinners. You guys ever heard that before? Well, I want to challenge our thinking here. If you've ever been taught that, that the church is a hospital for sinners, I want to challenge our thinking here today. Because the more I grow up and the more I'm reading God's word, the more I'm looking at other metaphors and really studying scripture, the more I see that that was actually not a good metaphor. It sounds good and it even sounds biblical. Jesus, after all, said in Matthew chapter 9 that he is the great physician and that he's not calling the righteous but sinners to repentance. And so it sounds like a good metaphor for church. But Hinsdale Philam, I, I, I just want to challenge you here today. If you've heard that the church is a hospital for sinners, there's, there's another phrase that goes instead of, a, instead of a museum for saints, right? That sounds right. It sounds biblical. But the problem is it's really not. And so today I hope to uh, I'll give you another metaphor that I think would better fit us and, and, and even be more true to Scripture. I, I really don't... Um, uh, as I'm looking at the hospital metaphor, I'm looking at the hospital and I'm like, man, it really isn't that great of a metaphor because, for one, the church isn't really a place where people go to in Scripture. The church is a place where people gather so they can then go out. It's not a place to just come like a hospital. Also, if, you, if we use the hospital metaphor, also... It could mean, if we take it far enough, it could mean that God just is like okay with sin. And so sin and God, they can just kind of be together. But let's be clear. God and sin can't be together. God hates sin. God wants to get rid of this sin problem. That's why we're in this issue that we are here right here in this earth, right? It's, it's because God is still taking care of the sin problem. Now, God loves sinners. We're his children, but he hates sin, Right? And then I think the, 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 the real reason why I can't agree with the hospital metaphor anymore is this. And I'm speaking as a guy. Because guys don't like hospitals. Am I right, guys? That's the last place. Dr. Goliath is like, yeah, that's right. If I didn't work there, I wouldn't be there. <laughs> that's the last place we want to be. You can ask my wife, when's the last time I ever... No, I'm talking to a lot of doctors here, so I've got to be careful. But when was the last time I just really voluntarily went to the doctor? I don't even remember. So you guys got to help me. I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to go to the doctor. I think I'm fine. I think sometimes us, uh, us guys, we think, oh, yeah, we're younger than we think. And we, uh, you know, we're fine. We're fine. We don't have to go to the doctor. So the hospital isn't really a good metaphor for guys. Now, I look out in the crowd here today, and I'm so pleased to see that there's a lot of men here. But a lot of places... And a lot of churches, you don't see that, you don't see a lot of men. And I think uh, the hospital is just a place where we, where we think of, we think of a hospital, we think of a place that uh, is painful. We think of a place that's really uncomfortable and we'd rather not eat the food. And we think, well, at least we got to pay for it, you know. So we don't think really too fairly about a hospital. So today, um, I want to move us to looking at a more biblical metaphor of church. Last week I talked about the church as a body. This week I want us to talk about the church uh, according to Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter 2. I want you to see it. And it's this right here. The church, this is the metaphor, is a living and holy temple. The church as a living 
and holy temple. Now let me tell you what I mean by a living and holy temple. In Paul's day, when people thought of the temple, okay, when people thought of the temple, or say they were to read these words that Paul wrote down, when they were to think of the temple, in their minds, they could visualize it. Without even looking at it, they could visualize it because it was that prominent in their life and in their culture. They would think of, oh, the temple. Yeah, I know exactly what that is. You know, just like when people think of the Chicago skyline. They, they know that tallest building, what used to be called the Sears Tower, right? And they can think of, when they think, you don't have to, you, don't have to, you can close your eyes and you can picture it. Well, this is what it was like back then when they heard temple. Well, this is what they thought of, this 150-foot glorious building that was, that was built with the precious metals and precious stones and gold. And when the sun hit it just right, if you, look, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you read the historians back in those days and the sun hit that temple just right, they said that you couldn't even look at the temple. It was so bright. And you can see that temple for miles and miles away. You can see Jerusalem for miles and miles away because you can see the temple. So when the temple was, was, uh, was in their minds, they would think of this glorious thing, this bright, shining um, uh, uh, place. And they would think of it and, and, and their hearts would just think, wow, that's awesome. I, I, I have so much pride in that. that that's the center of our, of our religion. That's, that's the place where, where, where God is. And, and they would just think of this temple as, as just a special, special place. You couldn't even look at it. It was so bright. By the way, on Monday is the solar eclipse, right? You guys have all heard about that? Now, they say don't look at it with just your bare eyes. It could destroy your eyes, right? You've got to have the proper glasses or the proper whatever to look at it. And, and, I, and I think of the temple in that way. As they describe it, you couldn't look at it. It was so bright when that sun hit it. And, and it was like this. But, but what happened? What happened was that people started to lose sight of the building because they were looking at the building as more than just the building. You guys got to stay with me, okay? I know I'm going through a little bit of a history here, but I go into my point. They started to see the building for more than just the building. They, put, they started to put their thoughts on the building. They started to put their, 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 their trust in a building. They, they started to think of, of, of the building as this beautiful thing, and they started to think more about the building as, a, as, as something more than just a symbol. And I think we've got to be careful with that even now in 2017. Because we have a lot of symbols, right, in the Christian church. We have a lot of symbols. And I think sometimes we could be really, if we're not careful, sometimes we could be like worshiping symbols instead of the substance behind it, instead of the meaning behind it. Are you guys with me? Yes. So we can look at symbols in a way that we weren't really supposed to. So Jesus comes and he comes down to this earth and he starts... Remember what I just told you, that people started getting prideful about the building and about the symbol. And Jesus starts coming, and he starts teaching, and he starts to de-emphasize the building. And he does it so much that people want to kill him. He starts saying things like, hey, guys, listen, I could tear down this temple, and I could build it up in three days. And they're like, what? Get out of here. That's blasphemy. What are you talking about? That's a holy thing. That's... That's an object. That's God right there. That's, and and, 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 they, and he, he just, and he, they're so unsettled because Jesus is de-emphasizing the building. And he's trying to teach them something else and they just weren't getting it. By the way, thank you, BJ. By the way, when I was in seminary, I was really warned a lot that if you want to see a church fight, which no one wants to see a church fight, but if you really want to see a church fight, just start changing things in the building. Start moving things. Start like changing carpets or changing the walls or start moving instruments or whatever like that. And you will see a religious fight. I was told that in the seminary. So please understand what Jesus is doing. He's de-emphasizing the building. He's not trying to say it's not important, but he's trying to help them make a switch. Okay? There's a switch that he's trying to make in their minds of this temple, of this building. And here's the switch right here. Jesus is trying to tell the religious leaders that instead of the holiness in the building, he wants to see holiness in the people. 
You see, they were looking for holiness in the, in the building, in this grand thing that they could look prideful in. And they were really setting their eyes on the building. But Jesus was like, no, no, no. You know what I'd rather have, guys? I, I, I would rather see a holy people than a holy building. By the way, I think that's very true because, you know, when Jesus comes again, right? We're all looking for that. We're all looking forward to that. But when Jesus comes again, you know what he's going to be looking for? He's going to be looking for a holy bride, a holy people. These buildings are all going to burn down. He's looking for a holy people. And so that's why... That's why I think this metaphor of a living and holy temple is so much better than a hospital or anything else. And so he's looking for a holy people. So I want, to, I want you to follow with me here in Ephesians chapter 2. You can read it on the screen or just look, look in scripture with me. I'm going to read it here in my Bible here in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to start in verse 18. And if you're there, say amen. amen. Or if you're anywhere close, say Amen. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Do you guys catch that? There's some key words there uh, that Paul mentions. And I just want to mention uh, another place in Scripture. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, you can look at there, of course, but I'm going to read it from my Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse 5 and 6. You also are living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So Paul said it in Ephesians 2. Peter says it in 1 Peter 2. Paul, Ephesians 2, 1 Peter 2. And I want you to understand this concept today. Please, please, please don't leave here today without understanding this concept. Please, church. What? is Paul talking about and Peter talking about and they're backing up what Jesus is, has, was talking about when he was on this earth. What were they talking about? Please get this. Please don't leave here without getting this concept. In the New Testament, the word cornerstone comes up five times. In five of those times, Jesus talks about them three times. He talks about the cornerstone three times. So obviously it's a very important subject for us to understand. What's a cornerstone? Well, here's... What the cornerstone is. I, I, I have a few graphics here to, to, uh, to, to help you understand what a cornerstone is. But I looked up in the Blue Letter Bible what a cornerstone is. And here's what a cornerstone hit, 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 here is. This is what it says. An important, first of all, it's an important quality or feature on which a particular thing depends on or is based. So the first, the first uh, uh, definition of it, of a cornerstone, is that it's what, is, it's, it's what the thing is based on. Okay. Second, second thing here, is it's a stone that forms the base of a corner of a building, joining two walls. So not only, not only is it a base, not only is it on the bottom, but it's the corner stone. It's the stone that's on the corner, so it adjoins two walls. You guys under, understand? You guys see the concept? It's on the base, it's on the corner, but there's one more thing. The first stone, it's the first stone in the construction of a masonry foundation. It's an important stone because it sets in reference all the other positions of the stones. It's the base stone, it's the cornerstone, and it's the most important stone because all the other stones are built upon that cornerstone. You guys with me? So this is what a cornerstone is. So you guys get this idea. The temple was built this way. And by the way, that original cornerstone in the temple, and I was there in Jerusalem. I studied Hebrew there for three months. And when I saw that cornerstone in what is left of the temple, of the second temple, and you have the western wall still that's there, they say that that, that cornerstone is a thousand tons. It's still a mystery how it was built. It's still a mystery how they even got that stone there. It's a thousand tons. And yet Jesus is saying, hey guys, listen, this is what I want you to think of as church. Church is now, there was a temple back in the day. 
But now church, this, this New Testament church that he, 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 he started and he dreamed of, this, te- this church now, you are this temple. Jesus is the cornerstone and each one of you is one of those living stones. And when you put all of those stones together, and, the, and, the, and those stones come together, and the base is Jesus Christ, and the corner is Jesus Christ, and, every, and, the, and the most important, single most important uh, part of that wall is Jesus Christ, and every single one of us is one of these living stones together, we are now the temple, the living and holy temple of God. Together, we are the holy temple of God. Together. The church is living and holy. And just like the Old Testament temple, when people saw the temple, 150 feet, and it was grand, and it show, and whenever the sun shined on it, people could see it from miles away. That's how the church is supposed to look like. When we're together and we're built upon Christ and we're together one by one, all of us are important, every living stone is upon each other, that when people see us and people see the church, they can see the church from far away. And they look at it and they say, wow, to God be the glory. They look at the church and they're like, wow, I I can hardly look at them because they're just so reflecting of the sun. Because they have Jesus inside of them so much that they're just like, they're just like reflecting God's love in this world. And that's we are, the, we are the New Testament living and holy temple. Do you guys understand? It's a really powerful metaphor when you see it. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is a really, really important verse. Now, <laughs> I must confess, in our doctrinal teachings and in our Adventist uh, uh, seminars, whatever, we, we have used this verse for a long time. And we use it for health. And that's okay. But let me tell you, we have got this verse really wrong. 1 Corinthians 3, for 16 and 17. You've probably heard it. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Have you heard this one before? And so we use it, and that's okay. We use it to kind of back up our belief. That's why we don't drink, and that's why we don't eat this, and that's why we don't eat that, whatever. And that's good, because we believe, yes, we believe we need to take care of this temple that God's given us, right? This body God's given us. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Right? You guys with me? We've used it to, to, to explain why we believe in the, some of the health principles that we believe. Amen. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is actually not about you. It's not about health. We're going to read it correct, and we're going to add, and you can look at this in the Greek if you want, okay? And check me. Please, always check me. Here's what it really means. When it talks about you... It's not talking about you, and it's not talking about you, and it's not talking about me. When it talks about you, it's talking about you all. It's talking about y'all, okay? So look at this in this context now. Do you not know that you, Hinsdale Philam, right now, that you are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you, plural, all of you, right? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and y'all are that temple. That's the church. That's what God imagined the church is a holy and living temple and that you and I are just living stones. We're like, we're like, these, we're like these bricks, you know? And if you put bricks together, I, if you just put like bricks and you kind of just throw them around, and, and, you know, as, as, as living stones, you put these bricks together, you're, you're, you know, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty secure. I mean, they're, you, you, can, you can still kind of step on them and, and get around, right? I mean, you can, they're sturdy enough, these living stones. I mean, that's you and I, right? Here's, here's us kind of separately, you know? You know, yeah, you can get around. Like, seriously, if I, if I needed to get over here to the mic or maybe to the front, I'd be like, yeah. Cool, okay, good. These living stones. This is great. I can get somewhere. This living stones, and uh, this is, this, these are strong bricks, right? These are really strong bricks. I could, I could probably do this for a long time until you get my point here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but really, what's the strength of bricks? The strength of bricks.
And imagine there's a cornerstone. Here's the strength of bricks right here. I can stand on this all day long. I think I'm going to keep it here. I feel taller. <laughs> the strength of bricks, man. You can't. Look, they're not even moving. You can jump all over it. You can do whatever. You can, you can ride a car on this thing. The strength of bricks is when they're pushed up against that cornerstone and they're laid on top of each other and they're together, the church is powerful. You can stand on a church like that. God shines in a church like that. Together we are a living and holy temple. Last week was a really painful week, wasn't it? Did you guys watch those videos of Charlottesville? Yes. And you can see it in those videos. You can see the division. You can see how people just, that this group hates each other and this group hates each other. And when hate comes together, it's inevitable. It's going to be violent. And it was terrible. It was terrible to watch. It was terrible to see. And it, it, was, it was awful. And I, the, the whole point, the whole time I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm letting my, my wife watch these videos, it was so bad. And this whole time I'm thinking, what is the church to do in all of this? Where is the church to stand in all of this? And, and, and God kept bringing me back to this right here, to this message right here that we're talking about here today. And I think the church in this time and in this age, in an age of division, needs to show the world what it's like to be united, what it's like to be strong, what it's like to have a cornerstone, because many people don't know what it's like to have Christ's love or to ever see Christ's love. And what other place than a church that that thing should be seen? That when people go to a church, they're like, wow, I never knew people could love like that before. Like when people go to a church, they're like, man, I've never seen such unity before in a group. I mean, shouldn't people in the world see that in church? And, and, and that's, what, that's what I kept thinking. Like, man, I've never seen that before. In this day and age of division, we need to be your, more united in the cornerstone than ever before. And this message really gripped me here this week because, I mean, it's just, it was like God just really spoke to me. And even in this devotional from my favorite author, this was just this week. And let me, let me show you what she said. I had to write it down. Every soldier engaged in the spiritual conflict must be brave in God. Those who are fighting the battles for the prince of life must point their weapons of warfare outward and not form a hollow square and aim their missiles of, destru- of destruction at those who are serving under the banner of the Prince Emmanuel. We have no time for wounding and tearing down one another. And I don't know what's going on here. That's the blessing of being new. (laughs) I could just come in and just say, hey, guys, um, yeah, we don't have to talk about the past. Let's look to the future and let's move forward. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, man, how many of us could say that we've been in church? And and that's, that's been the example. But what did she say? She says, guys, we don't have time to put the battle on each other. The battle's out there and the battle's strong in the world. We have no time to be battling each other. Let's battle the right battle and not battle each other. That's, the, that's what she says. Amen? You know, when, um, when I was, uh, last week, we, we, were, we, were, we were just getting situated and, and uh, we saw in this ad that uh, Brooksville Zoo was having uh, a free, like, like a free day or a free few days for kids. So we took advantage of that. We went to the Brooksville Zoo. What a great place, by the way. And so we learned a lot. We brought the kids and we learned a lot. And here I am. I'm just learning so much about animals that I've never known before. And uh, I learned something about horses and donkeys that I thought was so fascinating, okay? So I got some, I got some pictures of some horses and some donkeys. And uh, horses, I didn't know this, but horses have 64 chromosomes. Donkeys have 62 and when a horse and a donkey mate, they, they create a mule. I'm 39 years old. I just found out that a mule is a, <laughs> is, is a descendant from a horse and a donkey. Anyway, so when a, when a mule is created, 
since a horse has 64 and a mule has 62, that mule has 63 chromosomes, and that's why mules can't, um, can't create. They can't create other mules. They, they, they can't make babies. I was like, wow, that's interesting. So, so they kind of look the same, although horses are, 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 uh, are usually taller. Horses are usually um, more muscular. Donkeys are... Uh, Donkeys are usually shorter. Donkeys are usually known for being like animals of burden, animals that, that work, right? But this was what was really fascinating. And it talked about how horses and donkeys are different. And here's the main way. It's how they fight. So horses, when horses get attacked by, some, by, by something else, what they do is they form a circle and they face each other. They're facing each other, right, in a circle, facing each other, and they just start kicking. They just start kicking. So they form like this circle. They just start kicking out, right? Donkeys are totally opposite. Donkeys, when they're being attacked, they face, they face outside, they face the opposition, and they kick each other. <laughs> totally opposite than a horse. And I thought, man, that is so interesting. And I thought, what a lesson for church. <laughs> you guys know where I'm going at without me even finishing the sentence, huh? <laughs> then why is it that we are like donkeys? <sighs> Let me stop there. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Did you guys hear what he says? And you know, I, I bring this up without even really knowing your story, without knowing what's going on with history and all that kind of stuff, but I bring it up as someone who's new, who's coming in, realizing that after 14 years of ministry, chances are in a group like this, there might just might be some divisions. And I just wanted to remind us, as God's living and holy temple, that that's not what God has planned for us. That the beautiful thing about church and us coming together is that through God's Spirit, we are able to work anything out through His Spirit. Amen. Any kinds of divisions or any kinds of anything, we don't have to be like donkeys. This is probably my most quoted quote from my favorite author. Early Writings, page 119. I memorize it because I use it as often as I need to. And she says, she says, <laughs> if pride and selfishness were laid aside, Five minutes would remove most difficulties. Did you guys see that? If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would eliminate most difficulties. Now, some of you all are nodding because you agree. That's all it takes is five minutes that we just sit down. Whatever difficulties we have, maybe it's in church, maybe it's at home. I don't care where it is. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, all it takes is five minutes. Do you guys believe that? Yes. You guys believe that God's Spirit can work even with five minutes? Yes. And so that's what she says. We can't expect this living and holy temple to be blessed like God wants to bless it if we're not working those things out. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to be best friends all the time. But it means that we have to respectfully come together because we're brothers and sisters in Christ and be able to, through God's Spirit, be able to talk things out respectfully and with the Spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. So I, uh, before we left Florida, I, uh, I wanted to pick up some books to just learn about the place I was leaving. And I was in the library and I picked up this book called Grits and Grunts. Now, y'all are from Chicago and Illinois or from the Philippines. You guys, a lot of you probably don't know what grits and grunts are. But grits, gr grits, grits are um, a, a cornmeal-based type of food. Uh, you can, like, kind of eat it like oatmeal. And then grunts are like poor man's fish, okay? Grunts are like poor man's snapper. If you can't catch grunts, you're going to catch... Uh, if you can't catch snappers, you can catch grunts. 
And so grits and grunts is like the name of, of, of uh, a poor man's food, basically. And that's what they named this book, this fascinating history of, of Key West. Now, if any of you have ever been to Key West, you know how small it is. Key West is only three miles by five miles, three miles wide by five miles long. So it's a, it's a very small place. I can consider like even taking Hinsdale, cutting it out, and then just putting it as an island, and then maybe you will get Key West. Okay? And here's the interesting thing about Key West uh, in, in this book that I, that I read, is that Key West in the 1930s really started to get populated. People were really started to say, that's, where, that's the place to go, man. Go, go to Key West. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great place. So people from the east in the Bahamas, both white and black Bahamians, started making their way to Key West. You had people from Cuba, both white and black and Indians from Cuba coming north and going to Key West. And then you had Americans, both white and black, from the north coming down and going to Key West. And they were all trying to live in this area that's only three by five miles long. Can you imagine? That's basically seven different types of people living in Key West in one little place. Now in the 1930s, if you know your history, 1930s, this was a time of a lot of racial problems. But you know what happened? The Great Depression happened. And the Great Depression, a lot of America couldn't afford to buy food, and a lot of Americans were going hungry. It was an awful time in America for people who were living back then. They, they still tell us stories about the 1930s and the time of the Great Depression. But, but you know what? In Key West, it was different. In Key West, the people from Bahama, they, 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 they basically said, hey, you know what? We know how to fish. So we can bring our... Our, our fishing skills and we can, we can come and we can bless our community. People from Cuba, they said, hey, we know how to grow crops. And so they said, hey, that's what we'll do and we'll grow crops. People from America say, hey, we know how to start industries. And so that's what they did. And all three of those main types of people came together and they said, hey, if we don't work together, we are going to die. And so the story of Key West is so beautiful because it's a story of people who are so different from each other, but they learn how to work things out. You know, I uh, really prayed about sharing this today. And this morning, God made it very clear. Glenn, you need to share it. You know, if you don't like me after two Sabbaths, it's better that you get rid of me now anyway than if you get rid of me later. (laughs) But I really prayed about sharing this, and so I'm going to share it. I grew up in Loma Linda, Phil Am Church, the largest Phil Am Church in America. And that's just who I am. I'm a product of Loma Linda Phil Am. But you know, I saw something even as I was growing up that I've always wanted to confront one day and say, you know what? That has got to change. And I'm going to share it with you guys, if, that, if that's okay. I'm going to share it with you because I believe, and by the way, I've heard differently about Hinsdale Phil Am, and I praise God. But I've seen it too often, and, 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 and someone who was born in America, raised as a Filipino-American, I can think I can speak to many people who think like me, and that's this. I was growing up in a church, and I never understood why Filipinos couldn't get along. <laughs> and I would hear, like, well, because they're from that island, and not from this tribe, and not from... And as a person growing up in America who has enough problems with my identity as an American and as a Filipino-American, I said to myself, even at a young age, I said, that's the most foolish thing I've ever seen. Because meanwhile, me and my friends that grew up in church, we left. Because we saw that as an example. And Hinsdale fell out. I know I may be stepping on toes today. Maybe I'm not. But I prayed about this, and I just want to share this with you. If we don't start, stop that bickering with what island is better than what, we're going to continue seeing our young people leave church. And if the Bahamians and the, and the Cubans and the Americans can get along, I believe with God's spirit, Filipinos can get along. And we can change the trajectory of how our churches are going and we can stop losing our young people because they, instead of seeing division, they see unity. 
and we see ourselves as God's church. Not my church from this island or my not church from this island, but this is our church. Together, we are God's living and holy temple. God can do it, and he can do it right here in Hinsdale, Phil Am. I believe it. We got to have his spirit, and sometimes we got to have that change of heart too. We got to make that switch in our lives, in our hearts. So I'm going to call you to make that switch with me. I think it's time. It's time to stop. It's time to think of the church building and stop thinking of it as the center of religious life and start thinking of our homes as the center of religious life. That's how it was always meant to be. Stop, stop thinking that our church building is holy and that God instead is looking for our lives because we're the church as holy. Because, you know, when you think of the church as a holy building, then you think, okay, when I go to church, I'm going to be holy. But when I leave, I'm not going to be so holy. I don't really care about being holy because I'm not at church anymore. Do you guys understand how foolish that is? So that it's not that the church is not holy. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we need to act holy in God's presence any, anywhere, right? But, but you know what, church? You would never hear in the New Testament, you would never hear them say, oh, I'm going to church. You would never hear that phrase, I'm going to church. Because they understood, the people understood, no, I am church. So wherever I'm going, that is church. You guys understand? So wherever I am and wherever I go, I am a holy. And so it's not about being in a holy place, it's about being a holy people. And then, lastly today, let's make the switch from thinking that we can still have the Holy Spirit. And there's no unity when there's division. It's a lot... It's a lot to, to make a switch, but I believe that we can do it when we really understand why it matters. You know, there's a popular story. Uh, when I was in Ghana, Africa, they would share this as, a, as a, like a folk story, you know, to make a point. And when I first heard it, I didn't think it was all that great until I heard the punchline. And so, so this is what they shared with me when I was there. When I was in Ghana, Africa, they, would share, they shared with me this folk story, a very popular folk story about an African village. And they lost one of their young girls in this village. And so this, this, this tore the village apart. They, they, they searched and they searched for this young girl. And the last time they, she was seen, she was in this tall jungle grass. So that's where they looked. And so for the first day, they all came together. The whole village came together and they searched. They looked through this tall jungle grass they couldn't find her. The second day, they did the same thing. They looked through this tall jungle grass, and they searched and searched. They searched all day, and they still couldn't find her after two days. They worried that something had happened. Finally, the third day, someone came up with this great idea. And the idea was, how about we link hands? Let's all link hands and let's all create this one long line, this, 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 this chain-like fence, if you would, and let's go through the grass together. Not, not, breaking, not breaking each other's uh, 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 line and then just, we'll, we'll just go, we'll just walk. We'll just walk right through the grass, we'll all walk. And the story says that only after an hour or so, they found that little girl. But it was too late. And here's the punchline. It didn't really, wow, okay, so they found the little girl. But then when I heard this punchline, I thought, man, there's the lesson. When the mother was holding this little girl in her arms, and she was already dead, she said to the villagers, she said to all the villagers, if only we had held hands sooner. If only we had held hands sooner. And so today, I don't know what it's going to be like to get so many different types of people from so many different kinds of cultures, so many different kinds of styles and preferences, to all be together, to all be one, to all work for the same cause, which is the work of the gospel, is the saving of souls in our world. I don't know what it's like, but I know that it can happen, because I've seen it happen. Where people lose themselves, and they say, you know what, for the sake of the gospel, I'm going to talk to that brother. For the sake of that go the gospel, I'm going to talk to my sister. And I'm going to do it sooner rather than later. Because lives are being lost. Souls are being lost to this world. Our kids are leaving. 
Our young people don't understand it. And they don't get it why there's sometimes there's division in places like the church. And so I want to remind us here at Hinsdale Philae, as we begin this walk together, as we begin this journey together, let's be a church that can say, you know what? We're strong because we're together. We're strong because we're edged to that cornerstone. And by God's grace, we're going to be able to put away differences and we're going to move forward because we are the church. We are the living and holy temple of God. That's my prayer for our church here today. And may God always get the glory. Amen.